Welcome to Bible Thoughts, a podcast from Coram Deo Church. Bible Thoughts is all about taking small bites out of God's Word wherever you are and just chewing on them for a bit. I'm Rustin Harris, your host. Thanks for listening. In today's Bible Thoughts, we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 27, verses 42 to 44. This last week was Holy Week. And I wanted to take a little bit of time to linger on a particular passage in Matthew that recounts some of the uh, hectoring against Jesus while he's being crucified. At this point, Jesus has already been betrayed. He's been falsely accused. He's been scourged. He's been mocked. He's been pierced. He's been fixed to the cross. And now he hangs suspended above the ground. All right. That's the context for this passage. Here it is. This is the mockery. He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. So as we approached Holy Week, I began to think and meditate more intently upon the cross. And one of the things that struck me was the fact that Jesus was executed for our sins, but that he was also executed in a manner that intentionally sought to strip Jesus of any and all dignity. We often focus uh, a lot on the fact that Jesus simply needed to die for us on our behalf. His blood needed to be shed in order for our sins to be forgiven. Uh, And maybe perhaps we don't consider that the way that Jesus was executed also speaks to us. It says something. And when I preached the, the Good Friday service last week, I referred to the crucifixion as an apocalypse. And that's kind of, you know, people hear the word apocalypse and they immediately think, end of the world. But apocalypse really means revealing. It means revelation. That's why the, the uh, book of Revelation, which in Greek, if you translate the name, it's actually apocalypse. Um, but the, it, we've translated it as revelation. It means, because the word means revealing. It means uncovering, to see behind the curtain, as it were. And I believe the crucifixion and the mockery of Jesus in the crucifixion deeply reveals to us something. It reveals to us the evil of sin while at the same time revealing the holiness, justice, and the love of God. It's incredibly telling that the crucifixion, which was more than an execution and actually carried the intention of reducing the executed to a kind of subhuman status, was used upon the incarnate Son of God. When God in the flesh shows up, We execute him, but we don't just execute him. We attempt to decimate him of any and all of his dignity. That's what sin is. Sin is seeking to enthrone yourself and rebelliously subject the glory of God to degradation. Now, imagine the rare scenes today of the execution of murderers by lethal injection, okay? It's a small private room. There's an air of sober solemnity. The few present are a mixture of those who desire justice and that the murderer be brought to death. Perhaps some people are present are they're saddened to see their son or their brother put to death. Um, but the means of death itself is incredibly sanitary. It's methodic. It's painless. It's lethal injection. It is simply a cessation of life. It's a putting to death. It is a a euthanization. Um, Not, uh, that's the, like the polar opposite form of execution that the crucifixion was, right? Compare that with the execution of Jesus, who was not a murderer, but he was the one who healed the sick. He was the one who fed the hungry. He's the one who spoke truth 
regardless of consequence. He was the one who forgave the contrite. He was compassionate, gracious. He was the loving carpenter's son. So what does his execution look like? He's mocked and hectored on the cross. Listen to the, the, some of the ways that they mocked him from this passage. He saved others. He cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. That particular bit of mockery always reminds me of the way that atheists and, and anti-theists think about God and they think about Jesus. They have in their own minds a version of God. And the God who is truly real doesn't meet their expectations. But they don't realize how much their version of God is the one that they actually worship. They mocked, saying that if he's the king, let him come down. Then we will believe in him. They don't realize that the reason that Jesus is on the cross is because he is the king. My buddy uh, Brian Bailey, who preached a couple weeks ago at Coram Deo, said, He's the king we don't deserve, but he's the king we desperately need. This way of mocking God is still widely prominent in the world today. When people say, why would God care about what I do in the bedroom? They are disbelieving in a God who is intimately involved in his creation. And by disbelieving in that God, they're actually worshiping a false God. They're worshiping a God who is not intimately involved in his creation. When people say, if God is real, I would expect to see some evidence for him by fill in the blank, whatever they put in that blank. They're presupposing a God that they stand above, and they are acting as though they stand in judgment on God rather than the other way around. If God is God, he doesn't have to meet their expectations at all. He doesn't have to. He's not on. He's not on trial. He's the one sitting in judgment. God created everything. And that means everything is evidence for him. We don't get to say, God, I want this kind of evidence for your existence. Please create for me a special little bit of evidence. Um, God sometimes is incredibly gracious and does grant that kind of evidence, but to demand it is to fundamentally uh, deny God in the very asking of that question. Okay, here's another uh, strain of mockery we see in this passage. This is uh, yelling out to Jesus while he's dying on the cross. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. So this one really struck me when I read it recently. It's easy to kind of read over things. If you're familiar with the Bible, you read over them and uh, they kind of just roll over your mind or wash over you in such a way that you don't quite you really hear them. You easily are so familiar. You kind of like, oh yeah, I heard that part before. But consider this: there's there's something about the way that this passage is translated that doesn't like doesn't help convey the sense of the jab of this mock. Listen to this line again. Let God deliver him now, if he desires him. Now hear it again with just a slight change in the words, but the, the words mean the same thing. Let God save him if he wants him. The mockery in this line is that we don't want you. That's obvious. We're crucifying you after all. And God doesn't want you because if he did, he'd be saving you from this. You said you were God's son. Well, if you are, I guess God hates his son. He doesn't want him at all. It struck me because similar to the first mockery I talked about, They have no idea what they are saying. Jesus was crucified and he willingly laid down his life, apparently because in love, God wanted us. He wanted us to be saved from the wages of our sin. He wanted us to be delivered from the wrath that our sin deserves. It almost sounds like heretical or blasphemous to say it, but he wanted us. He desired us and he made us worthy of that desire when Christ paid for our sins on the cross in order to make us righteous. So when they mock and they say, if God wants him, let him save him. 
oh there's something there's something deep and dark behind that mockery we don't know we don't know what we're saying when we say something like that because it's the reason that christ was forsaken was so that w we could be saved um, we he was forsaken so that we could be saved because god desired us uh, the son knew the forsaking of the father because the father was with the son desiring to save sinners so uh, one more one more line here from this passage and the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way this last line is uh, somewhat unique to the gospel of matthew i'm not going to get into the the question of the of the the robbers and how I think Luke mentions that one of the robbers uh, is not reviling him. Um, I'm just going to focus on what Matthew's talking about here. He says that those being crucified with him reviled him as well. <laughs> this is this is crazy. This just exposes how deep the sinfulness of humanity is. Sinful humanity is too deeply against God that even those who are being subjected to the most heinous dehumanizing act still take it upon themselves to take the time to revile and tear down the only innocent one, the Son of God, who is being subjected to the same shameful execution that they are. Don't you think that you're, while you're being shamefully executed, you'd, be, you'd, you'd refrain from maybe hurling insults at the person who's being executed alongside you, knowing that you're going to be put to death in the same manner that they are this is this there's something about this passage that i have to say there's there's a tendency for some more liberal minded theologians to say that jesus in the cross was expressing solidarity with the oppressed meaning the weak slave class that was the kind of people that were putting being put to death on crosses frequently um Jesus, by being crucified, uh, expresses solidarity with the lowest of the low. Now, here's, here's a bit of a problem with that. The lowest of the low are not here depicted as some uh, precious uh, class of people that Jesus has stooped down to rescue. They are depicted just like those in power who put Jesus to death as sinful revilers of the Son of God. Jesus did not come and die on the cross in order to express solidarity with the marginalized. He came to rescue sinners from their sin by paying the debt of sin, no matter who those sinners are. And guess what? All are sinful. All are just as desperate for the shed blood of Jesus on the cross. And that's what this particular section should remind us of. Well, thanks for joining us today for Bible Thoughts. I hope you appreciated uh, thinking about the cross today. Until next time, keep chewing on Bible.